It's time now for Harm Reduction. Heard every Tuesday at 7 p.m. with Will Beaton. Cutting Edge Radio, where we'll ask the questions others don't want to ask. Now here's your host, Will Beaton. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Harm Reduction Report. This is Willard T-Belly and the crew bringing you an interview from your pal Cal back in good old G-Funk, North Dakota with David Owen an associate with the movement to legalize marijuana in North Dakota. They just attended a screening of the psychedelics. The psychedelic club of UND put on a screening of reefer madness propaganda film of 1936. They are about to discuss it. Thanks everybody. Stand back on. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. It's your pal Cal. I'm sitting here with Dave Owen. Hi guys. Thank you. How are you doing today, Dave? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Cal. Awesome. Thanks for being here, man. So we just got off reefer madness. It was a nice turnout couple people intimate we got to see the film um so let's start with the beginning uh the smoke like the fact that it's green and colored and all that um clearly ridiculous yeah (laughs) um and i i I love the scenes where these people are smoking marijuana in the main room and getting all crazy but the people who are drinking shot after shot of alcohol where the guy goes where do you put it all mary do you do you put it in your leg (laughs) <laughs> and she is completely drunk. Yeah. And yet she's painted as the voice of reason in the room. Yeah, yeah. It was very interesting movie. Like like one of the most interesting things. I'm I'm really glad we picked this movie. Um and I'm excited to do it again, an, a second screening. Um but people grew up on this video and and it was presented almost as fact. Like this was a huge portion of drug education back then. Yeah, they they even at the start say this is a real bait this isn't a direct telling of a real case but it's based on a real case in new york city and it's based on your town and all that and it's nonsense but. yeah it was it was impressively unrealistic uh it, it it starts off depicting these people with like great lives they had they're like you know um normal normal kids doing tennis doing sports having relationships and being friendly and fun yeah. happy uh you know students and stuff and <laughs> they just devolve they, yeah. they totally, like, escalate into this terrible life where they're and getting murdered. And it's over, what, like a week, supposedly? Yeah, it looked like it was about a week. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, they've got to be the wealthiest family in New York City because oh. the places they're living are fantastic. Yeah. But, yeah, it was very unrealistic. The acting was bad. Um, I well, imagine... I can forgive the acting. On a $2 million budget in today's dollars, that's not a lot, and it was produced by a church, and it's very clear they were using church volunteers. And yeah. That's obvious. So I, I don't so much criticize the acting. I do think one place the film gets it right is when it talks about the dangers of driving high. Yeah, they I did mean, that well. They did that. Now, do I disagree with how it would have looked? Yes. But do I disagree with the premise? No. Right. And in that case, it's a little fine to exaggerate because the goal is to tell the kids, don't drive high. Mm-hmm. And I, I 100% agree with that part of the film. Yeah, that's one of the criticisms I've heard about this bill, the legalization of yeah. uh, marijuana, is that there, there are people saying like, oh, this bill does nothing. It's the most liberal, loosely defined bill ever, and there's nothing – like people are going to be driving high and stuff. And it's like that's that's not what the bill no, um, does. So there is a specific cent- portion of the North Dakota Century Code which talks about DUI that we don't repeal. Um, and what that means is that exists and that continues to exist. And I'm trying to pull it up here, the exact wording, because I want to make sure for all the people out there who don't agree with this, um, i got to pull it up. It is. It's dangerous. I mean... Yeah, DUIs are dangerous. You should not be driving drunk. Right, yeah. Whether you're a supporter of legalization of cannabis or not, you know, you you can't be driving under the influence. I wouldn't feel safe if people are driving around intoxicated on substances. And that rule... You know, I demand that that rule stands. People, and it will, it will. So, it's 39-08-01 of the Century Code. And what it says is, the statute makes it illegal to operate a vehicle while under the influence of any drug or substance of or combination of drugs or substances, including the mixing of drugs and alcohol, which renders that person incapable of safely driving. And it furthermore says, even in the statute, that whether or not a substance is legal does not act as a defense. It is not a legally admissible defense in the court. Sure. So you don't even need to, to add anything like that into the bill. Right. It's and already covered. Yeah, we cover it. it. We're like, that stays. And there's a reason we want that stay, because mm-hmm. I don't want people 
driving high. And yeah. I was talking a little bit at the start of the film that may have gotten cut out. What I don't like is what I call the, DU, the uh, DUI defense of the .07. Yeah, yeah. So imagine that two people leave a bar and they're both drunk, right? You're at .07 and another guy's at .13. Now, the .13 guy's getting a DUI no matter what. We don't need to worry about him, okay? Because he's way over the legal limit. But let's say you're swerving all over the road, all right? You, you could probably kill a family of four. You're that bad, mm-hmm. okay? And um, you're given a breathalyzer because you're pulled over by the cop. Dude, what are you doing? And he gives you a point. Oh seven. Well, now you can't really be charged with a DUI. Mm-hmm. You'll end up getting disorderly driving or aggressive driving or some other driving charge, but not a DUI. Um, and that really bothers me because it creates a little loophole where you shouldn't have been driving. We all know you were incapable of driving the vehicle, but they can't charge you with the substance problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that speaks to the way people respond differently to everything, uh, you know, physiologically. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, Anyone, so, so that's where that's where like sobriety tests can come in, and the uh, performance, field. the field performance, the field sobriety test, kind of based on uh, you know a person's performance. Are they able to pass these performance tests? Um, if not, then they're not able to be. Yeah, they're I, not. They're not good enough. To I, as a general rule, if the cop needs to pull you over because you're swerving all over, you're one of three things: you, you're way too tired to be driving. You're driving under the influence of alcohol or you're driving under the influence of something else. Mm -hmm. And I can kind of understand the first one, you being too tired. Right, yeah. But there's no excuse for the other two. Yeah, yeah. And to be honest with you, exhausted driving, we probably should do something about that. Um, Because I know a bunch of truckers who have CDL licenses and there have been points where they're like, it felt like I was driving drunk. Yeah, yeah. Um, And there needs to be something done about that too, to be honest with you. But Yeah, it's a serious issue. So that's uh, <clears throat> that's one of the bigger uh, arguments I hear against legalization. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's bunk. It, it is bunk. It, it's not the case. It simply isn't the case. Yeah, and, I mean, you know, as strongly as I feel about DUI, I would ne- I would never have written a bill that could allow DUI. Right. I don't like DUI. I don't think we're strict enough on it, to be quite honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you look at what we do here versus what happens right over the river in Minnesota, yeah. it is very different. They they handle things a little more strictly in minnesota um they they aim to deter the dui yeah much, and much that's more. why we have laws to stop people from doing very dangerous activities and, and that's the problem with these types of films people are because they were lied to basically by the government people now believe that marijuana is this horribly dangerous thing mm-hmm. um they were saying that's more dangerous than opium, more dangerous yeah, than heroin in the movie. That was surprising. Yeah, like in the one of the very first scenes. Yeah, um, I can tell you firsthand that that is not the case. <laughs> I, I can tell anyone that there is no good faith person who can make that argument. You can't argue in good faith and say it's more dangerous than opium. It's more dangerous than heroin. You just mm-hmm. can't. Yeah. Um, and the bizarre thing is that's the way actually marijuana is scheduled. So, as just as dangerous as uh, heroin. More. more dangerous, yeah. It's up there with heroin and LSD. And heroin is actually, I think, Schedule 2. I believe heroin is still Schedule 1. Is Most it? of the other opioids are Schedule, schedule two. 2. Okay. Yeah. Heroin, I think, they don't use medicinally at Or do all. they say the... No, they say the medical form of Schedule 2, which is diamorphine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, but think about it, right? There are... Opium and all that are classified less strictly than marijuana under the current law. And it's nonsense. And what it really does, and the saddest thing about this, is not that we can sit here and have a good laugh. It's not even, to an extent, the fact that people now believe this and pass laws around it. What it does is it erodes our government's credibility. Mm -hmm. So that when they try to tell us something important, kids aren't going to listen. If kids hear marijuana is worse than opium, and they try marijuana with no ill effect, and believe me, if you use marijuana, there will not be ill effects... Um, that's known at this point. I'd say that's pretty much a fact. Mm-hmm. They're going to go, well, opium is supposedly less dangerous, so why don't... Why should I believe them on this? And when you lie to people repeatedly when you need them to believe you, it's like the little boy who cried wolf. Um, we're all told that story as a kid. Yeah. And that's what the government's been doing. They've been a little boy who's been crying wolf over marijuana for 40 years. Have you heard of that group now that is here in North Dakota, uh, like rallying against? Oh, my favorite people, Sam. What is it, Sam? Uh, they're called Sam. Smart about marijuana. I, I, Smart approaches to marijuana. Yeah. Yep. I, yep. 
Uh, I, I I agree that they should be called SAM, but I think it should be stupid approaches. <laughs> um, what are they? What are their arguments? Like, what are they? Are they basically like mimicking this reefer madness argument type of stuff, or do they? They're any- a little bit toned down. Um, they're not obviously that four people are going to die in the period of three weeks. Right. That's they're what this not- movie depicted. That people die. They they rape and they kill each other yeah. because they've been using marijuana. That's the, what this movie showed. In this movie, there were what? Two murders, a rape attempt, and a suicide attempt. Yeah, think. all because of marijuana. And they were hallucinating. Uh, hallucinations and guns and stuff. It was it was all super exaggerated. Yeah, it, it was ridiculous. Um, but no, basically what Sam tries to argue is that it is very dangerous and it should be treated as a very dangerous substance. And they produce a bunch of statistics that aren't true. Um, and they just go around trying basically a misinformation. How do they produce uh, untrue statistics? So, Where for do they example, get... let's say I say the crime rate in Colorado went down, which is true. There's no debate about this. You can check the de- Colorado Department of Crime, which mm-hmm. releases the statistics. You can check there. Um, it may not be exactly called the Department of Crime, but it, they have a crime report. Just okay. like the FBI has one for the nation. Colorado has one for the state. Sure. Well, what they'll do is they'll do what I call data mining. They uh, will find one county in the entire state of Colorado where crime went up. And so they'll say that that is representative of Colorado. So first off, they dig. They find a county where they're looking for a statistic that matches their argument. But then they stretch even further. They, they use a correlation as, yeah. as opposed to a causation. So they say like crime increased and then they speculate that crime increased because of the legalization of marijuana. Right. And look, if I want to look year to year, month to month, I can find a county in this state where crime goes up. I can find it every year if mm. I want to. Yeah. Um, and once you start doing that data hacking, it's called p-hacking. Where you're basically look, you already know the answer you're looking for, and you find data that supports it. You're no longer arguing in good faith. Okay. Because Colorado is a state of what four million people? I'm not sure exactly. I don't know. I want to say three and a half to four million. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that you can find a county every year where the crime has fluctuated up slightly. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they say things. They'll do raw numbers as opposed to per capita numbers, and I'll explain what that means for everyone who's not exactly scientifically minded. Per capita means per person. Raw is raw. So let's say there's a town of 10 people, and there's one murder per year in that town. That would mean 10% of the town is murdered every year. Not not a great town to live in. Sounds like Baltimore. Yeah. <laughs> um, now let's say the town increases to a population of 100, and the murder rate rises to 4. So the total number of murders went up. But the percentage went down drastically. It went from 10% to 4% Mm -hmm. in this example. And the reason I'm using these numbers is because 10 and 100 are easy to conceptualize. It's easy to do the percentages in your head. Yeah. So when the population increases by 5% and the raw number of incidents increases by 2%, crime went down, not up. Yeah. So that's the tricky thing. That's why why it's easy. I see. That's why they're easy. It's easy for them to get these statistics that are... Uh, seemingly convincing on the surface, but when you dig a little deeper to see what the statistic actually means, it's 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 cherry picked. It's right. mined, like and, you said. And, and people don't know better necessarily. Yeah, but no, they I, they sure do. Um, well, so why do they do it? Why do they do that? What's you know, in it for them? It, it's it's an agenda issue. I mean, like, who are these people? What what is the reason that they? I I, I don't want to sling names, but we all know the usual suspects who are against marijuana legalization, and it's a combination of the usual suspects. What it is are people who oppose it from an ideological perspective and realize that an ideological or a moral argument without facts and figures is no longer acceptable in our society. And so they are ideologically opposed to it. It could be for a bunch of reasons. Maybe they had a bad experience as a child. Maybe they had a family member who had a bad experience. Maybe it's religious reasons. I'm not trying to single anybody out here. But sure, sure. Y- you know what I mean when I say usual suspects. And it's people who are very much against it from an emotional level. And they need to create a logical reason to be against it. Mm. Um, and it's why they appear very angry when they're challenged. Um, I don't know if you saw Bob Weefold on Point of View, but he flat out said, I don't care about medical. I don't care 
that people aren't getting new medicine. And, and what I hear, of course, is that someone like Bob Weefield is okay with people dying of cancer and suffering when an alternative is available. Yeah. What Bob Weefield thinks, presumably, because I don't think he's an evil human being, is that they're just pawns in a game. And no, Bob, people aren't pawns. And yes, Bob, this legitimately helps people. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that's how you get those statements. It's not coming from here. I'm pointing my head. I realize it doesn't translate well. It's coming from here. The emotional part. part. Yeah, Yeah, like you said, they're responding emotionally and not... But they're almost not responding emotionally in the right way. Like they're they're not considering other people and and their emotions and their needs. And they're not accounting for the fact that, you know, people respond differently to medicines. And some people, a lot of people, respond very positively to cannabis medicine. Right. And, um, you know, the fact that the voters of North Dakota voted on medicinal cannabis and it's still not here... It'll it's never, not fair. It's not right. It's very almost kind of cruel. It's inhumane. It's right? inhumane. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I've gotten to the point where I do not legitimately believe we will see medical cannabis in 2019. Um, I don't believe it'll come. You hear them promising all the time, but well, it's not here. they've already moved it now back to summer of 19. Um, I don't know if you remember this summer. It was fall of 19. Yeah. I mean, this is like... Two years. Two and a half, three years it's going to be. Three, five, seven, Like, nine, why? I, you know... 19, 24. It is frustrating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel, I feel the frustration. I do feel the frustration. It's like a slap in the face to the voters, to the people of North Dakota that want and support medicinal cannabis. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm really excited for the full legalization of cannabis. And I hear people refer to... Do you avoid the term recreational no, I mean, I'm not apologetic about what this is, but well, I, 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 don't, I don't think people understand there's two sides to this coin. Yes, there is a recreational side, and yes, that plays a huge part in this bill. That's why we call it full legalization. Mm-hmm. We're not afraid of that. That being said, there is a heavy medicinal side to this bill, too. Yeah. Because the reality is, and I was even talking with an old Republican legislator. Um, he doesn't want to be named. Um, I'm sure you can figure out who it is from the story. And we were at a Fargo Chamber of Commerce event, and afterwards he told me that his grandmother used to burn it when his mother or father, I can't remember exactly, had a cold or had an illness, and it would help them breathe better, and they'd go to bed, and they'd feel better afterwards. And he said it's no secret that the people of North Dakota understand that medical marijuana is a thing. Well, if he's, it was used like he says it was, and I have no reason to doubt him. Um, he's still against recreational, so I have no reason to doubt this story. Um, then why should it not be legal for those things? If it used to be used as an herbal remedy for colds and flus and all that, and it was safe back then, then what is the big danger? Mm-hmm. Um, and this legislator, if they hear your program, I don't think they do. They know who they are. Um, <laughs> and... Yeah, if, if it was so harmless that your grandmother used to use it to treat colds and coughs, why is it so controlled? Because the medical bill as written is so obtuse and so hard to do that basically most things you won't be able to get it for. All True has gone on the record saying they will not give a prescription for medical marijuana lock, stock, and barrel. Sanford has said the same. Um, the big hospital in Bismarck has also said that. So if Ultra won't do it and you live in Grand Forks, where are you going to get your prescription? That's the problem. That's why, you know, we need to fully legalize it. And what I was kind of getting at, when, when people talk about recreational marijuana, like it's this is, you know, the legalization of recreational marijuana. I, I'm on board with that. But I also like to kind of stray away from that term recreational because for me, that's not even what it's about. I, I, I appreciate the fact that it ought to be about that for some right. people. And it totally is reasonable. But for me, it's like... Uh, you know, it's harm reduction. It, it's, it's harm reduction. People are getting locked up and their lives are being ruined because because of this yeah. prohibition well, yeah, on, here, on cannabis. It's crazy. You, you pay tuition at UND. I pay tuition at UND. What's our tuition this semester? It's what, about 5000 4 to 5000 Yeah. Somewhere in there. <laughs> um, so a year for us is ten. After we figure out where we're going to stay by the books, it's about ten to 11000 for us. Mm-hmm. That's about right? Yep. Okay. 
Well, you want to know how much we spend locking a person up in prison per year in the state? Yeah, I know. It's about it, 40000 Yep, 40000 I heard 42000 I've heard 45000 it, it, it fluctuates depending on the year. I'm going to be fair. The range is forty to forty five. Yep. So let's take the bottom of that range, forty. Okay? Let's assume the prison system gets more efficient this year and it's at the bottom, 40000 Well, that's four full tuition scholarships to UND. Easy. Yep. Because you and I both say our tuition is about four to 5000 a semester, which is about eight to ten a year, it's close to that ten, as mm-hmm. you and I both know. So it's between four and five scholarships because if it's nine times four is thirty-six, five times nine is forty-five. So it's anywhere between four to five scholarships that we're not giving to students. We're blowing money, man. Yeah. <laughs> we're totally blowing money we, on this we would, thing. We would rather lock up a guy for marijuana use, okay, than we would send four to five kids to UND tuition for. Yeah. And it's, that shows your priorities are backwards. Yep, backwards priorities. I hear the argument, uh, you know, if we legalize this and people are making these unhealthy choices to use cannabis, which there isn't a whole lot of research that suggests that it is unhealthy anyways, but let's give people the benefit of the doubt on this one yeah. and assume for the sake of their argument that cannabis is dangerous to health and people are out there smoking this legal weed and having uh, dire, dire health consequences, you know, 20 years down the road because they've been smoking marijuana all their life. Well, if you legalize cannabis and tax cannabis, they're paying for their own health care in the end anyways. Yep. As opposed as opposed to us locking that person up right now on the spot and us co- it costs us $40,000 a year, let them pay for their own health care by, you know. Yeah, and, and per- the, the big thing is we can do what we did to the tobacco companies. Right now, if someone uses marijuana their whole life, and let's assume it's true. It's not, but for the sake of your argument, let's assume it's true. They're buying from a dealer. That dealer doesn't pay any taxes. That dealer doesn't contribute to the system. Let's compare that to tobacco for a second. When I buy a pack of Marlboros or Camels or Newports or Native Spirits, whatever you pack you choose to smoke, um, as long as it's not a sovereign tribe rolled cigarette on a sovereign tribe, which Native Spirits isn't, mm-hmm. um, but let's pretend all cigarettes except for that, Okay. Part of those companies' revenue is, by law, beyond the taxes, mandated to go to the health care of those that use their products. They are mandated to have warnings all over the box saying, hey, this could kill you. Um, and those warnings get bigger and bigger. They're not allowed to advertise towards children without serious criminal penalties. And what you've done is you've basically curbed tobacco use. Tobacco use went away on its own. Yeah. Basically. I don't know many people that smoke. It's assuredly not like it was in the 40s or 50s, okay, (laughs) where virtually everyone smoked. Right. So tobacco use solved itself. And how did it solve itself? Because the white market was able to be regulated, and over time, people had all the facts and chose whether or not to use the product. Now, I don't, I want to be very clear, that's not true of marijuana. Marijuana is not dangerous. Marijuana does not do those things. But even if it were, the best thing you could possibly do is treat it like tobacco. Because tobacco has killed itself yeah, by very publicly killing its customers. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. If cannabis turns out to do that, it will solve itself in the end. Right. That, I, I, I appreciate that line of logic there. That is good. Yeah. I haven't heard it put that way before. Um, I want to play devil's ad- advocate for a minute. Sure. I've heard a – what I consider, aside from the, uh, the driving while, while stoned – um, argument. I, I consider this next one probably the better one, and I have just heard it recently for the very smoking first time. In public? Nope, not that one. But that's another good one. Smoking <laughs> in public. How will we address that? But let's do that later. Uh, the one that I think is really interesting is uh, my girlfriend brought this to me. I don't know where she heard it, but um, basically, if we were to legalize cannabis, then the federal government will not fund particular aspects of the state. Um, the like currently they cover cannabis related uh, costs, death by cannabis or whatever, which obviously isn't isn't an issue. But so we get zero dollars. Got it. <laughs> yeah, pr- pretty much. I, you know, I guess in order to ask the question, uh, you know, sufficiently, I would have to pull know up some where the stat. Money's going. Yeah. Right, right. But what what do you think about that argument? Like, so, if the if the federal government is is saying like, hey, we're not going to fund this, 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 or this so if the, you legalize. So the general rule is the things they stop funding. Our special drug task force targeted at marijuana. Oh, okay. Okay. And marijuana is now legal, so we don't need a marijuana drug task force. They stop 
paying for the training of dogs for cannabis. Well, wonderful. We don't need that. Um, most of the things that they quote unquote give the state money for are to enforce the prohibition laws that are on the books. Well, the prohibition laws aren't on the books. You don't need the money. Mm -hmm. So it's a wash. You're not losing any money. The money that you were spending, you don't need because you're no longer spending it. Sure, sure. I wish I knew more about this. I wish I could play devil's advocate a little bit better on this The real concern is banking. Um, And we have a solution to that in North Dakota that's very unique. And that is the state bank of North Dakota. Because typically marijuana dispensaries have a problem. It's called the cash flow problem. Mm -hmm. Everyone's got to pay cash. No debit cards, no credit cards. There ain't a vendor on this earth that will do it. But the state bank of North Dakota will. Because the state bank is immune to a lot of the federal laws. Because it is a state-run bank. Which means the banking problem in this state is solved. Because that's the real problem of the cannabis industry in Colorado is the banking question. How do they move the funds safely and securely? Um, and once you have a bank that will accept your funds, you've solved this problem. And North Dakota could really, and this is a revenue stream that no one talks about, be the marijuana banking, banking exclusively, mm-hmm. capital of the world. Because the infrastructure is already there. We have a multi, multi-million dollar state bank. Um, and then we can take that money and do what banks do, which is invest it and get a return for the citizens. Okay. Um, and that is the biggest thing about North Dakota that makes it uniquely positioned in the current federal issue, the federal question, um, because it allows all these dispensaries and all these marijuana people to open accounts in North Dakota and literally park their money here. Everyone likes to make fun of Swiss bank accounts, right? Mm. Well, it's, it worked really well for Switzerland. Um, (laughs) I don't know if you've been there, um, but they do really well by taxing foreign investments huh. and we could just tax out of state investments. That's interesting. I have not heard that. I don't know much about that. I'm having trouble processing that honestly. But Well, think about it. There's no bank. If you want to open a Wells Fargo account, what's uh-huh. the first thing they ask you? Uh, name. Social security number. Social, okay, yeah. Okay, they ask you for your tax ID and then they look up what your business does. Okay, I, I can tell you from experience, Wells Fargo did not want to open an account for legalized MD okay. um, because we were a political campaign lobbying for full legalization of marijuana. And they said, we are not opening an account with you. Thank you. But most banks ask what your business is and what your tax ID number is. Most marijuana dispensaries then say, it's this. Federal Reserve says you cannot have funds from the illegal federal activity or else you are complicit in wire fraud. So all the banks say, no, thank you. And as a result, there's nowhere to put the money. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I know that's, that's weird until you kind of study the industry, but... North Dakota has a very unique opportunity to be a become a financial capital Interesting. for marijuana legalization. Okay, so there's a little bit of oomph, but <laughs> like, hey, let's do it. Um, you know, I've heard things. I, I know a couple people that are like very, very tech savvy, and they know about Bitcoin. Do you know anything about Bitcoin? I know cryptocurrency. I know enough to say that I don't know a lot. Right. Yeah, and neither do I. I mean, um, you know, I've spent several hours trying to figure it out, and I know a little bit. But I've heard people saying that like Bitcoin. Uh, in in some states has been a way around some of these banking issues. And I don't like that idea because I'm an American. I like America. I love America. I like dollars. Uh, Yep. I like like dollars. Lincoln, Franklin, and Jackson. (laughs) Yep. I appreciate, you know, I appreciate uh, government money. I appreciate the government getting money, the state government, the even the federal government. I don't necessarily like this illegalization thing, but, you know, I don't want, I think what Bitcoin does if if we put all of this, well, it cannabis, allows you to launder. It's money laundering. Money too. laundering, basically, and and it weakens the American dollar. If 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 cannabis industry is forced into using Bitcoin as a way well, to, well, I can tell you what they stop doing. The second you start taking Bitcoin, you stop paying income tax, because well, how much money did you make? Well, who knows? Because you're taking. There are two problems now with even paying. The, let, let's assume you wanted to pay the taxes. You would have to pay a tax on the initial income from the sale and then when you tried to cash out your bitcoin you'd have to pay capital gains tax that's assuming you want to pay Mm -hmm. the taxes what bitcoin is very good at doing is making it so you don't have to pay the taxes it's all unmarked unregistered non-transferable funds i don't like that people are being people are being forced into do it like cannabis is an industry and it's going to be an industry it's a business it's a business and it always will be it always has been, and it's going to be no matter what. And I, you know, I don't like the idea that we're losing money, we're weakening the dollar because of this. Yeah, I, I don't like it either. This um, federal grudge, this federal like. 
And that's where a state bank comes in. Because if you have the state bank, you pay the IRS out of your state bank account, you send them a check, you're done. Mm -hmm. You don't have to get the Bitcoin, then transfer it to an altcoin, then sell, sell the altcoin, usually on Coinbase. You can also sell Bitcoin on Coinbase. I don't recommend it because um, they'll usually pay you in altcoins. But sell yeah. the coins on Coinbase, then find an ATM to withdraw the funds or have it go to your personal PayPal, then move the PayPal back into a personal account, then take the personal account and write a check to the IRS. You're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. The amount of paperwork is going to be absurd. And you've got to track all your transaction fees. You've got to track all the increases in Bitcoin value over this process. Oh, wow. That, and that happens Good every luck. second. <laughs> because if I pay you now one Bitcoin, which is no one's going to pay a Bitcoin for a marijuana. Right. But let's make the math easy. I pay you one Bitcoin. It's worth $100. It's not. But we're making the math. I assume it is. Really easy here. By the time you go and sell that Bitcoin, it's worth $120. Well, you now have to pay 23% in capital gains on the 100 to 123 so 23% on $23. You then have to write back off your transactions and processing fees on the capital gains investment. You've got to figure it right off the processing fees. You've got to get the check. You've got three layers of currency processing fees you've got to write off. You've also got to track the initial value of the sale. And if you did it in Bitcoin as the initial median of exchange, you've got to go back to the exact minute because of how much Bitcoin fluctuates to when the sale was made to calculate your initial income. That's a lot. For sales tax, then you've got to take your personal income out of it and pay income tax. It seems so much Good easier. Luck. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're that's going to do it. It sounds so much easier to just legalize it yeah. <laughs> federally. Yeah. Um, let, let me tell you how simple ours is. I write you a check. You say, thank you, sir. Yeah. You hand me the bag of marijuana that I've purchased, <laughs> and you then go deposit the check at the state bank. Mm hmm. The state bank, you then write a check to the IRS and whatever state tax agency. Um, North Dakota doesn't call theirs the IRS. Um, but you write it to whatever tax collection agency is your state collection agency. You are done. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. By way of comparison, compare that to the Bitcoin process. Yeah. Which one is more likely to get done? Right. We've got people who don't pay taxes as it is. We don't need to give them an excuse not to pay taxes. What do you think the biggest thing is? Why are people reluctant to accept this idea of legalization? Well, is it, it it's what the we are very resistant to unlearning things we learn from people we trust. So if your grandmother who you loved dearly your whole life told you that you grew up your whole life believing that 1 plus 1 was equal to 3. You'd be very resistant to the idea that it was actually two. Right. Um, because it came from someone that you trust, from someone who was an authority, and for someone who was right about a lot of things. And when you have to unlearn something that came from someone you trusted, it's, it's inherently difficult. Because you have to admit that the person you trust was not trustworthy on that issue. And that's where the psychological block really comes in. The issue isn't learning a new thing. The issue is unlearning the old thing mm -hmm. and accepting that the people who taught it to you are wrong. It's why when someone who you don't like tells you something, you are less likely to remember it right. it's than easy. when a friend tells you. It's easy to dismiss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so that's the problem. They were told their entire lives by friends, family, parents, and the government that this was a horrible substance that did what reefer madness says yeah and yeah we need uh honest education i mean yeah, and we need something honest what they don't tell you is there was an agenda there and the agenda was to make it so that it wasn't legal and when you have an agenda on something you're not gonna present the truest things which is why i never try to make it according to me i i always try to direct you to where you can find things and, for example, they say that it's a gateway drug. Um, and that's a relatively new argument. That argument starts in the 70s after they tried the it's the worst drug possible. Because notice in this movie, it's not the gateway drug. It's the pinnacle drug. And so they kind of flip the argument in reverse to it being the gateway drug to the real bad yeah. drugs. <laughs> um, and we know that that's not true because of the Journal of the American Medical Association. Right. They tracked in states that legalized marijuana. Um, and they tracked opioid abuse and overdose in those states. 
And after legalization, you saw a decrease of approximately 20 to 25 percent, yep. even on the state. And that's statistically significant. We're not talking 1 or 2 percent. We're talking 20 to 25 percent. That's a, statistical, a statistically significant drop. So that kind of dispels the notion of the gateway drug, doesn't yeah. it, when you see that? Yeah, so following legalization of marijuana, opioid use decreases about so, 75%. So yeah, that's So I don't know if marijuana use causes the opioids to decrease. Um, I can't say that. But what do you I speculate? Could, I, I speculate what happens is people who are on opioids realize that marijuana is a safer and better control for a lot of the symptoms that they're trying to fight with the opioids. And they, as a result, switch to marijuana. The so, pain medicine market in this country is astronomical. Yep. I've heard it referred to as a gateway out. And in this yeah, case, that's, that's kind of what it's... That's what I would speculate is happening. But I'm not a PhD. Right, I right. can't tell you. What I can tell you is if marijuana was what they said it was, opioid abuse and overdoses should have gone up. Mm-hmm. So if their argument is true, you should see a huge increase in drug use in these states yeah and what you see instead is a collapse yep yeah so there's that there's there's one way to debunk the gateway theory another another way another thing we uh came up with in our little psychedelic club student for sensible drug policy meetings we were just sitting there having a discussion a small intimate group and we were we were talking about how legalization this again we're giving these people the benefit of the doubt where when we're saying like, okay, let's assume for a second marijuana is a gateway drug, which, you know, we have now de- established that it's not. Um, but let's assume, once again, give them the benefit of the doubt that it is a gateway drug. By legalization, by legalizing cannabis, you're separating it from all the other illegal drugs. Um, you know, whenever you walk into an alcohol, a liquor store. You know exactly what you're buying. Yep. If, and if there's, you're buying vodka, it's 40%. If and, you're buying... Um, Let's say Midori, because I like drinking Midori. Okay. It's 20%. <laughs> yep. It says it right on the bottle. It's it's safely labeled, and there's nothing – you're not going to be sold heroin. There's, and, there's not going to be ecstasy at the store. And if there's anything in that bottle that shouldn't be there, you can sue them. Someone will be held accountable. Like, for example, Cap- this is actually a story that I'll call Captain Morgan. Lied about how much alcohol was in their rum. They were found guilty of it. Because they were saying that it was more alcohol than it actually was. Captain so, Morgan? Yes, Captain oh, Morgan. Wow. Uh, this happened recently, recently being the past three years. Okay. I and didn't they know were that. found um, guilty of lying to the customer, and there were consequences. Um, now, and there wouldn't be if alcohol was illegal. Right. It, it would be happening all the time. People would be still having that bathtub gin. Uh, like in the days of prohibition, people were, were drinking uh, dangerous. Blind. They were going blind. They were drinking dangerous liquor because there was no regulation. It was unsafe. Yeah, yeah. Alcohol during prohibition caused people to go blind. And what we now know is it's not the alcohol. It's whatever was in it that shouldn't have been. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I agree 110%. Okay, what about kids? Let, let me, let's me let get to this. What about the kids? Do you know anything about statistics in Colorado or any other legalization state, the rate of kids that have been using marijuana? It's, it's slightly down, but it's not statistically significant. It stayed about the same? It stayed about the same to slightly down. I've, statistical significance is about 5%. Okay. So it's slightly down. The total I've, number of kids, again, it's the per capita issue. Sure, sure. I've speculated that it, it would... Um, it would go down because, uh, you know, this is all anecdotal um, based yep. on my, my speculation is based on my anecdotal experience, of course, little disclaimer. Um, but when I was young growing up, it was easier for me to get marijuana as opposed to alcohol because it wasn't legal. I didn't need an ID to go into the, the marijuana store and purchase marijuana. All I had to do was call up a friend and get it illegally. It yeah. was easier for me to get to get marijuana. You, you, you called a guy who called a guy and you had what you wanted within probably three to four hours. Yeah. And and that's you know. Whereas good luck getting the uh, twelve pack of beer at the store where everyone knew everybody in that town. Yep, and nobody wants to go. Nobody wants to go do that. Nobody wants to go buy uh, weed or booze for a minor. You know, people yeah, don't want to do that. It's it's a pretty bad penalty nowadays. But then when you get into uh, drug dealing, you know, I, I think people that are dealing drugs they don't they don't always ID, and it's easier to get well, into the hands of minors. Well, the reason people who deal drugs don't care is because the punishment for possession. For so long has been ridiculous. Yeah. If you possess, sitting in this room that we're sitting in, which is the Memorial Union, okay, if you, you see that Sigma New House, yeah. the fraternity houses, and the houses all around us, mm-hmm. okay, trying to paint a picture for people who may not necessarily, University Avenue. <laughs> um, 
every single person in every single one of those homes technically could be pursued for felony drug charges because they're regardless of possession because they're in because they're within a thousand to two thousand feet i don't know the exact well i think it's a thousand thousand feet of a school zone yeah and that is a substantial portion of the kids on this campus live within a thousand feet of und yeah or university property Heck, even that uh, art center downtown right next to Empire, the little gallery, mm-hmm. is technically university property. Really? Yeah. Wow. From a technical standpoint. Wow, that's crazy. And you don't think about that. So if someone got arrested in the right by uh, Bonzers, or not Bonzers, yes, Bonzers, all right, you'd be hard-pressed to tell me Bonzers isn't within a 1,000 feet of that little gallery. So the people that live above Bonzers are now getting a felony because of a school zone. Yeah. They're like, what school? Yeah. They, they, <laughs> they're, they're like, they're almost, you know, I hate to say it, that they're almost like victim. They've been victimized in this situation of, of this silly law. The victims. Everyone and, locked and, up for marijuana is, is a victim. Yeah, yeah. For a victim of a victimless crime. Um, and you and I both know that that law had great intentions. It was designed to keep it away from the elementary, middle, and high schools. Mm-hmm. We can all agree we don't want pot at the elementary school. We don't want it at the middle right. school. We don't want it at the high school. But this is what prosecutors do. They take the most extreme version of the language to get you to plea out early, to get you to plea it down so they can move on with their life. Mm-hmm. Um, and partially it's because our court system has problems, but that's another topic for another day. But... When you're facing felony charges and you're not near anything that you or I would consider a school zone, would you consider Joe Black's within a thousand feet of a school? No, it's downtown Grand Forks. You have yeah. people partying. That's... I, I'm willing to bet that if you got out a tape measure, you could probably get to that uh, gallery. Mm-hmm. You certainly could at um, Skies. You certainly could at um, Bonzers. Mm-hmm. Point being, it's like easy to accidentally be within a school zone if you're like getting real technical. Yeah, and, and the law a is a college school zone, nonetheless. Yeah, the rule is that, real technical. Yeah. Um, and when you're facing felony charges, which is what I was trying to get back to, when you face pel- felony charges, basically everywhere, it really doesn't matter if you're selling to a minor anymore, because you're you're not talking about a year in prison versus a misdemeanor. Mm. You're talking about five years in prison versus three. Yeah. So, and you've warped the incentive structure so much that the punishment is no longer a disincentive. Hmm. Whereas, if you let's when it's legal, you'll lose your ability to sell marijuana. Well, that's a million dollar penalty, essentially. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, you know, I try so hard to empathize and understand where people are coming from when they're against. I understand 100% where they're coming from. It's, I, it's misinformation. I do too. I, I, yeah, you have to understand. You have to try and understand. Um, You've um, got the patience of a saint. I mean, you're not like me. I, <laughs> I, I don't have as much anywhere near as much patience as you do for it. <laughs> I get frustrated. I definitely get frustrated with it. I mean, um, you know, it's it's a human right. People deserve the right to tinker with their minds, explore their minds, and... They, they deserve the right to kind of treat their own unique physiology, their own disease, um, without fear of, of persecution and prosecution and jail time, yeah, the, prison the, time. The jail time is the thing that kills me um, because let, 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 let's talk back to marijuana for a second. Let, let's imagine that you're convicted of a marijuana crime, right? Well, you're going to prison. You're going to prison for about 30 days in this state, statistically speaking. Okay. You're going to pay about a $1,000 fine. Okay. The, the fine's not the worst part. 30 days in prison is. What does that mean um, if you're going to school right now? Yeah, what, yeah. What's, you ruin your thir- semester. What does 30 days in prison mean? Well, you failed out that semester. You failed if, out. If you've got a scholarship, it's gone. gone. I'll have to call that back later. Yep. If you got a scholarship, it's gone. If you So if you're relying on a scholarship to pay your bills, it's gone. And you won't be able to get student loans now. No more student loans. Yeah, it's all crazy. So how do you... Well, that means you come out of jail, and you've got a couple semesters into your degree, and you've got all these loans, or if you got the scholarship, you don't have at least you don't have loans in that case. you got to go start working a job. Well, if you can never get student loans, how are you going to pay for school in today's era? So you're ruined. Your yeah. life is thrown off course for the next 10 years. This person was trying to better their life. And, and if you've got a felony, you'll never get a good job, because name me one place in this town that wants to hire a felon. I'm not, I mean, I guess I don't know, but the people are more reluctant. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's harder. It's just basically harder. We, we make life harder for people the, than we have to. We the, can't. The single worst thing about using marijuana is getting caught with marijuana. 
Yeah. And, and that's when the incentive structure screwed up. Well, let's compare that to drunk driving. The single worst thing about drunk driving is you could have killed a family of four. The single worst thing about assault is you sent someone to the hospital. The single worst thing about murder is you took someone else's life away. And the punishments try to reflect that proportionally. That's why I argue that DUIs aren't strict enough, but the theory is the punishment reflects the crime. What's the damage that you do to yourself during marijuana? Well, I'd argue nothing. So what should the punishment be? If you're not endangering anybody and you're not damaging society, and I don't believe you are, then there should be no punishment. Mm -hmm. If there is no victim, there can't be a crime. Because name one other crime where there's no victim. I mean, at least methamphetamines, the victim is you, ultimately. You're, you will die. Yeah, yeah. Opioids, the victim is you. Mm -hmm. Because you lose control of your entire life and you snowball out of control. Um, and alcohol, the, there isn't really a clear victim. Every now and then, there's a drunk who needs to get his life back together, but there's not really a victim. Um, I can't think of a single crime, really, where there's not a victim. Beyond marijuana. And people say, well, Dave, what about a speeding ticket? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> but the speeding ticket in the state is about 25 bucks. I paid a couple of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I wonder how people would respond. Like these people that are in such adamant opposition to legalization. If it were their kid. If it were their kid. Exactly. Like once their kid gets involved, uh, I saw this with my dad, you know, my dad was very much took the stance, uh, of opposition, totally, yeah, totally hard fisted about all drugs and everything. And he saw me get tangled up in opioids and he came to understand my situation, uh, you know, more deeply, um, how it just sort of unfolded. It was an accident. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't mean to hurt myself and my family doing opioids. Yeah, you weren't the hardened mafia tough guy like in the film. No, yeah, he, <laughs> he <laughs> right. <laughs> He opened up to the idea that, like... People make mistakes. Yeah. And if they're not harming anybody, let them make it. Nobody goes and says you can't have too many beers and get drunk in your apartment. I mean, let's compare the two. Get, what is the stigma behind getting drunk in your apartment? Um, well... Even among your parents. No, no, they'd go, I wish you didn't, but... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a fear of alcoholism. If you're drinking alone, you might, you know, that's yeah. kind of a red flag. But, yeah, there isn't much of a stigma. Otherwise, you know, people go home, enjoy a, a drink of scotch by themselves. Yeah. Or Nobody whatever. looks at me funny when I go to the Texas Roadhouse and I have a margarita. Mm -hmm. Nobody. There's not a soul in that building. Right. It's just it's just normal. There is no stigma. Um, oh, that, that brings up the issue again that we kind of jumped past uh, about public public use. Oh, public use. Yeah, you can't do it. <laughs> Um, is that in the bill or is that something that will need to be added? No. So where it is, is similarly to how DUI is a result of a previous statute, smoking in public is a result of a previous statute. It would be under smoking and burning ordinances. Okay. Remember how... Covered. Already covered. Yeah, because you're old no enough. No problem. You're old <laughs> enough to remember this. Remember when vaping started to be a thing? Yeah. And they immediately said you can't vape on university streets? Yeah. Because the cigarette smoke ban also applied to the vape smoke, even though vape smoke isn't technically... We're not going to get into that argument. But basically what they said is because the ordinance targets the production of a chemical substance which can cause blah, 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 illegal. Same mm -hmm. thing with marijuana. Because gotcha. it produces a vapor slash smoke which can be inhaled and have adverse effects on the people that inhale it or imbibe it, it's covered. Good, yeah. That's, so that's... we don't specifically cover it. We don't – because – our printout of the bill is only the things we changed. Yeah, you don't so have we, to cover it. It's already there. Well, people don't understand that just because it's not in our printout of the bill, that it's not already somewhere else. Sure. And this is a case of it already being somewhere what else. What other situations are there like that? Where people are saying, like, hey, I have this really good argument. Um, um, there was one about child neglect, which was absurd. They said if you were high on marijuana, you'd be allowed to neglect your child. No. No, you wouldn't. Yeah. What follows is the same fundamental argument of if we don't expressly cover it in the bill, somehow by wizardry, <laughs> the existing laws will go off the books. Yeah, like somehow you're allowed to just do whatever you yeah. – whatever the bill doesn't cover, you're allowed to do it, and even though it's already in place right now. There are some 
what I'll call well-intentioned people, and there are some poorly intentioned people on that argument. Um, now, certainly our attorneys have argued with them till they're blue in the face. Um, we've had an attorney who's won multiple awards in California and Missouri, who's represented clients in federal courts in all 50 states, who's won award after award after award. The woman's plaque is spectacular. <laughs> um, and she said, no, it doesn't do that. We have an attorney out of California um, named Jordan Parker who's gone on the radio, and we're thankful that he's given us a lot more time than he really is required to, yeah. um, to talk about this and say, no, it doesn't do that. We've had uh, Nicholas Sarwark, who's a former deputy public defender in Colorado, and he was there before and after legalization, um, and he read the bill and said, you guys are good. This does what you think it does. It doesn't do what they're saying. And I think any attorney that seriously argues this is either an attorney trying to create clientele or it's an attorney who is arguing in bad faith. Okay. And when I say bad faith, I mean someone who knows better but is cho- pretending that they don't. Sure. Yeah. Because there's nothing wrong with the average person listening to this and saying, well, I, I think it does this and here's why. And because they're not a lawyer, I can understand how they get confused. They simply don't know. Yeah, they don't know or they don't understand or they've made a mistake. Mm. That That's fine. That's good faith. You've seen something. You've brought it up. You want to talk about it. When it becomes bad faith is when you know better and you propagate an agenda based on falsehood. Yeah. Um, I want to jump gears real quick again. And i got to get going in the next 10 minutes, okay. minutes here. So gotcha, let's gotcha. wrap up at 6.50. Yep. Okay, gotcha. I want to ask, do you know anything about law enforcement? Are they mostly on board, mostly off board? And can you tell me anything about why? And maybe do they deserve any like taxes and stuff? So, I know in Colorado they've been, they've been given a little bit of tax to law enforcement. So law enforcement is mostly against this when it comes to the organizational structure. When you get to the higher ranking, when you get to the people that are doing the press releases, okay, they're against it. So not necessarily a majority of law enforcement, necess- but the higher... I, I don't know about the majorities of law enforcement because I'm not in the meetings and there is an aspect of fear to this where if they come out and support this, it could be construed as coming out against a federal law. Sure. So yeah, there is right. a very large aspect of fear in the public eye I gotcha. for a law enforcement officer saying that they support this. Sure. Because what they're essentially saying is, I support you defying federal law. Mm-hmm. And now, you and I don't think of it that way, but that's what they're trained to think of it as. Remember, yeah. we don't make the rules, we just enforce some mentality, mm-hmm. um, which is a good mentality to a point. Um, and so that creates a problem on the first hand. The other thing is when I talk to officers privately, they're generally for it. When I talk, because they, they've said multiple times, I've never been afraid of going for a marijuana call. I've been afraid for my life whenever I had to go for an alcohol call. Mm-hmm. I wonder if people like, you know, be, I can't imagine myself being a law enforcement officer and like taking pride and joy in arresting someone you know, a college student that's doing yeah. normal life, but they, they're arresting them for cannabis. You know, I can't imagine, like, taking joy in that. And I, I think that there probably isn't no, there's a, a lot of there's that. There's no joy in stopping the harmless pothead. Right. Um, there, there might be people within law enforcement that believe, you know, that, that cannabis is dangerous and that they're helping this person by arresting them. But that, again, comes down to the misinformation. I'd say that's few and far between, to be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I think... I think a lot of law enforcement is at the point where the higher-ups are still against it, and therefore, much like in the military, when the general says, this is the plan, that's the plan, yes, sir. Um, but I think in private, a lot of the, a lot more are for it than the media would have you believe. Mm-hmm. And the ones, the few legitimate concerns that they have, and this is a big one, is the retraining of the drug dogs. They're going to need about $200,000 to retrain their drug dogs because the drug dog is trained to hit on cannabis. So we ought to redirect some of that tax money to them. They deserve it. Yeah, they've said it's going to cost about $134,000. Um, it's in the budget report. I think that's a little low, honestly. I, I think probably $200,000. Okay. Because you want to make sure that the dogs are trained to the best of the ability. The officer has some extra time to bond with the dog. Long story short, you want to make sure that dog is a part of the team and it's not rushed into the field 
And when you rush, you make mistakes. And when you make mistakes, ultimately, either people get arrested that shouldn't, the dog bites someone. Yeah, that lawsuits and stuff. Lawsuits. Yeah, big it, deal. It's better to take the extra week of training than to try and rush it sure, out. Sure, sure. Cool. So is there any is there anything else that you want to cover that we didn't – anything you want to tell? I, I always love doing interviews with you because you give me like 50, 60 minutes of just free form. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I think we covered everything. It's not a gateway drug. Um, oh, we did not cover what it will do. Um, and that's important to understand. Okay. The ceiling of records. Okay. Yeah. That's a good one. Yes. Yeah. So there was a big scare because people didn't understand what – Sealing of records was um, because we used the legal phrase, which was expungement, which is the fancy way of saying sealing of records. And what a sealed record is, is let's say that you go to apply at the loaf and jug. Okay. Um, and you apply for a job there and it asks you, do you have a criminal record or convictions in the past? Before you had to check yes. And it would show up and statistically that was the end of your interview. Done. Um, same with an apartment application. But now you can check no and be a law-abiding citizen. Okay. And what that means is, and we're only sealing nonviolent marijuana crimes where you did not sell to someone under 21. Yep. Or break any other law, like driving while under the influence. So, drive, so how that would work is the possession charge would be sealed. The driving under the influence would not be. Okay. Good. So fair. they'd, ha- they'd so have fair. to segment it. So let's say you're charged with... Um, possession of marijuana, distribution to a minor, and consumption of marijuana. Because these are three charges where you could reasonably all happen at the same time. The possession and imbibement or consumption would go away. The distribution to a minor would stay. Awesome. That's good. Yeah, that's, that's what we want. Yeah, we um, want people to, to be accountable for selling to minors. Yeah, if you sell we to kids. We want people to get in trouble for victim crimes yeah, yeah if you sell to kids I, I don't feel that bad for you right yeah to be honest if you do something criminal something wrong the record should reflect it yes um we're and, just talking about possession and consumption of cannabis that and you if, want. if they sold it to a 30 year old okay if they sell to someone under over 21 it's also sealed so if i had a record for selling to you and you're over 21 i know that for a fact mm-hmm. it would be sealed i don't oh, have a okay. record i see but Sale as long as it was to someone over 21, sealed, under 21, stays on. Okay. Because the reality is I don't care if you sold to a 40-year-old. Uh, free market. I don't care if you sold to a 15-year-old. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a problem with that personally. Yeah. And so what that means is you can now get a job. You're going to statistically be more likely to get student loans. There's a lot more doors that open for you to better yourself and move on with your life. And contribute to society. Yeah, yeah come on. These people are currently buckets that we have to fill up and we made them a bucket arguably an empty bucket yeah and what we're going to do is we're going to turn them into faucets where they can contribute yeah 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 awesome 